It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Radio and realagriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Wednesday midweek edition of the show. Hey, thanks so much for making Real Ag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a part of your workday. Today's show is brought to you by U.S. Borax, refined and specialty borates for every industry and application. For a century and a half, U.S. Borax has provided refined borates vital to industrial processes and agricultural and commercial applications. Mined and made in America, their products set the global standard for quality and purity, ensuring the best performance in every process. Make sure you go to Borax.com. Great to have U.S. Borax aboard for today's program. We're going to be talking today to Dr. Terry Griffin. He is with Kansas State University. We're going to dive into the topic of technology adoption on the farm. What are some of the trends? What is next? And, you know, obviously we got to work in some conversations there about artificial intelligence as well. So looking forward to talking to Terry today. We'll also talk markets with Tess Seaford of Zaner Ag Hedge. Uh, what's going? Do I take oppor- Do I take advantage of some of the bounce that we're feeling in the market here as of late? Do I? Maybe, is this an indication to hold? What does Ted think? Uh, we'll get to that. We'll also hear from today's show sponsor, U.S. Borax. We're going to hear from Roger Gunning today on the program about some of the things that they are doing at U.S. Borax. If you have any feedback on today's show, we'd love to hear from you. Send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com, or you can call that Real Ag Feedback line, 855-776-6147. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk markets with Ted Seifer of Zaner Ag Hedge right after this. We have the financial tool you're looking for. An advanced payments program, Cash Advance from CCGA, is a low-cost farm financial tool that can help cover your spring working capital needs. Borrow your first $350,000 interest-free with the rest at prime less 0.75%. Apply on over 50 commodities. Call our experienced team or visit ccga.ca. Cash advances are made under the Government of Canada's advanced payments program. How's your seed quality? What should you treat with? What about herbicide carryover and environmental concerns? Spring is here, and you've got a lot of things to think about in regards to your pulse crop. The Pulse School on Real Agriculture has information and advice for all these questions and more to help you navigate this season. Brought to you by BASF. Pulse School episodes are available at pulseschool.com, realagriculture.com, or as a podcast on your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. Infuse some energy into your next corporate event, customer meeting, or conference with Real Ag Radio, Canada's national agriculture radio show. Create a unique experience at your next event with host Sean Haney, broadcasting Real Ag Radio live on Sirius XM, featuring exciting guests, captivating interviews, and the latest news from the agriculture community. Contact advertising at realagriculture.com or call 587 587- 787-1795 to book your on location with Real Ag Radio today. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio. Today's show sponsor is US Borax. Make sure you talk to them about Granubor. Ask for it by name. Go to borax.com. Great to have US Borax on board today as the show sponsor. Let's talk markets. Joined right now by Ted Seifert. He's with Zanarag Hedge, based out of Chicago, Illinois. Ted, great to see you. Always a pleasure to see you, Sean. Thanks for having me. Okay, uh, I guess uh, from a broad perspective, how would you explain these markets right now? How how are we trading? Yeah, you know, it's a weather market. Uh, um, First of all, we're well off our highs. We've been in a downtrend for for grains and uh, oil seeds, you know, corn, wheat, soybeans, everything. It's been in a downtrend since the beginning of the year. But just in the last couple of weeks or so, we've kind of picked ourselves off the lows, most notably in corn. And a lot of that's because we've gotten kind of dry here over the past month. Um, and, and by kind of dry, I mean really rather dry, right? Uh, there's a lot of comparisons 
being made right now to 2012 and how we're maybe actually in a worse scenario right now than we were at this time in 2012. Uh, the problem with that is that, you know, the, the, the forecasters, the guys that know a lot more about it than I do, are telling me that, yeah, this is temporary. Things are going to get a lot better through the second half of June into July and August. And if that happens, well, then this, this strength that we're seeing is really rather temporary. The thing about it is, you know, the markets had the, the, the opportunity to sort of focus on the supply side and the problem, potential problems for the supply side of the equation for the last couple of weeks. It's taken our focus off of the demand problem that we have after years of high prices. Hmm. And so while we're focusing on that supply side and not focusing on the demand side, again, it can allow for some higher prices. But as soon as we kind of fix the supply side problem, if the rains start to happen, well, then we're going to go back to looking at the demand side of the equation. And that's not a very rosy picture, Sean. That's really the thorn in the side that we've had since the beginning of the year. You know, we, for the life of us, we can't get our corn exports going. Our soybean exports had been good, but they've really slowed down. We don't have a whole lot of unshipped bushels out there. In order to hit the USDA's target, we need to see some more sales in soybeans. We're just not really getting them right now. Uh, and it's not really the time of year where we should be getting, especially after a really solid uh, first season Brazilian soybean crop. So, again, if and when we get back to focusing on demand, which will come with the rains, uh, then you got to look out below. There's, there's, there's issues, right? So there's a potential for quite a bit of, of movement to the downside. So, but for the moment, you know, while we're still dry, we could see some higher prices, but we need to be taking advantage of that, I think. I was just going to – that's exactly what I was just going to ask you. This, this yeah. What we've been hearing from analysts over the past number of weeks is, you know, sell – take some risk off the table, sell into some of the rallies, uh, look at them as opportunities to offload some risk. That's what I'm hearing from you as well here, uh, provided that we do get that rain at, at the back end of June, beginning of July. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple ways to work with that. And, and first of all, I want to be a technical trader and, and give people a technical point on a chart where I would like to see a whole bunch of order stacks, you know, either to sell cash or HCAs or, or you know, sell futures. And for, for that, in December, corn's 560 or just shy of 560. And for November beans, it's 1240 or, again, just shy of 1240. The problem is it's hard to be a technical trader in a weather market, right? Because, you know, you can have these, these chart objectives, but as soon as the rain starts happening, you can throw all that out the window. So, to your point, I think you got to kind of scale in, and I think now is a great time to start doing that. If you get a chance, if we get a chance to sell more aggressively at uh, again 557 December corn, I think you should sell a really nice chunk of that there. I'd really like to see people up to 65% uh, sold on this bounce. I know that's going to be uncomfortable for some because of the dryness. Because hey, you know, I, I I have a hard time selling a crop that I'm not sure I'm going to have. Well, yes, but 60%. I mean, we're all going to have you know, 60% of a crop really should. Hmm. Um, but there's other ways to approach it too. Like if you if you think there's more upside potential, if you think this weather issue is going to continue to linger, you can buy calls against cash sales, you know, to, to re-own those bushels and participate in more of a rally if we're going to get one. Call options are actually relatively cheap to where they've been trading the last couple of years. Um, the other thing you can do, if you don't want to actually commit to selling bushels, you can buy puts. Uh, buying puts, you know, create a $5 floor in December corn, Hey, that's not a terrible thing. Uh, you know, historically speaking, five dollars is a great price for our, our, our new crop corn. It's not the prices we've been seeing the last couple of years, but it's still a really good price. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a number of different ways to approach this, depending on your level of comfort with, I mean, the potential for margin calls and things like that. Um, depending on your comfort of what you have as a crop to sell, uh, but one way or another, you know you really do have to get fairly aggressive on your marketing. Because if you wait to the end of the year, if you wait to harvest this year, it could really be a problem, especially if you paid a whole lot more inputs back in October. And that that big problem being driven by the weakness in demand in the back half of 23 into Q1 of 24? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at the second season corn crop happening in Brazil right now, it is going to be a lot better than what we were originally expecting. And, you, you know, that... Uh, a portion of that crop got planted late, so there was initially some concerns about it. But now you look down there, and the analysts continue to, to up their their numbers. So that's going to be uh, a headwind for us uh, as far as we're going to have to compete with that Brazilian corn crop. 
We know China is now buying Brazilian corn. Uh, I think China has designs to buy as much of that Brazilian corn as they can to avoid us. So that's a problem for us. Um, and, and again, the high prices are the cure for high prices. I don't love cliches, but that's a really good one. You see global demand kind of tailing off because, again, we've been at years of high prices. Our exports this year are the lowest they've been in 10 years. Uh, and that could carry over into next year unless we have much lower prices. And therein lies the rub, right? I mean, a lot of people think that. Yes, exactly. So a lot of people think in like 480 to 450 should be the floor for December corn. You know, I mean, that's I, I understand that argument, but really that argument's based on fundamentals that we were trading six months ago. That's not based on fundamentals that we have right now. My concern, Sean, is that in order to buy that demand back, we might have to go well below those those numbers. We might have to go into the low floor, low fours, possibly even high threes. And that's sort of a catastrophic situation for guys that, again, have paid a whole lot in inputs. Now, there's some some guys that waited to the spring to buy a bulk of their, their inputs. They're not in as bad of a, of a position as far as that's concerned. But either way, this was probably the highest risk corn crop that we've ever planted. You've got to be cognizant of that, and you've got to be fairly aggressive with your marketing, especially when you have a 50 cent bounce off of lows like we've just had, Sean. Do you feel the same? Like, are, are wheat, corn, and soybeans facing the exact same demand scenario? Or are they kind of in an equal bundle there, relatively speaking? Uh, I've been really kind of focusing on corn with that. Yeah. You can say that wheat demand has just been a real struggle. And that's sort of been tailing off for a couple of years now. One, we've got more global competition. Two, the dollar's been quite a bit stronger than than most other currencies. And three, you know, just kind of a change in 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 diets, not just here in the United States, kind of led by us in the United States, but you know, North America as a whole, the whole whole world. So wheat demand kind of fading as supply comes on from the rest of the world. It's why we really haven't gotten this big boost out of that the Russia invading Ukraine and so on and so forth. I mean, we did initially, but we've not been able to hold on to that, obviously. Um, and then soybeans is sort of the last one there. Soybean demand has kind of hung in there or had, at least until the world knew that that first season Brazilian crop was there. But even if you look at a balance sheet for next year, Sean, the soybean balance sheet at a 300 to 335 million bushel carryover isn't overly burdensome like a 2.2, 2.3 billion bushel carryover in corn. So the soybeans might hold on to a little bit of that balance sheet tightness uh, unless there's a big shift in acreage, which we won't know yet until the end of this month. But um, yeah, you know, the soybeans, I, I'm the least demand bearish on soybeans. I'm the most demand bearish on corn. Wheat's kind of in the middle, but probably closer to corn. Um, so that's an interesting question. You do kind of have to look at them separately. But in, in a broader picture, high prices everywhere has caused some sort of demand dis destruction. It's just there's a higher degree of that demand destruction that has happened in corn than there has been for soybeans, at least to this point. Let, let's finish up with livestock. What is going on in cattle? And then I'll also add to that, what is going on in hogs? Yeah, right. Uh, we'll start with cattle, right? I, I, domestic demand has been super strong. And that's coming at the same time where we've seen the number of animals uh, in production drop fairly sharply. Um, and by the way, that, that drop in production comes from really high-priced feedstocks and the drought that we've had in the plains. So... Uh, we don't have as much supply. Demand is is strong. It's not really tailed off with these higher prices like we would expect. Now, it is starting to. We just saw on this last holiday weekend that demand maybe wasn't quite as strong as what it had been in previous years, but it's still relatively strong compared to where the prices are at. So as long as bo box beef prices go up, as long as uh, uh, as packers have a halfway decent profit margin, they're going to continue to pay up for cash. And the cash cattle trade is, is actually now more in the hands of producers, whereas for the last however many years, it's really been dominated by, by packers. It's a nice thing to see. The problem with it is that eventually people will start walking at the prices, especially if we head into some sort of economic depression, recession, you know, something like that. If, if we have a, a, a domestic or, or macro problem where people are, are afraid to go to the butcher's counter and spend the money on the higher cuts of beef, uh, then you will start to see 
that bubble start to burst. But at least for now, the fundamentals are fairly bullish. Cash cattle continues to trade higher. We, we continue to trade at a discount to cash, so there's more room for the upside uh, on the futures market, I would say. Now, on the other hand, you've got hogs, which have been under a tremendous amount of pressure really since the beginning of the year. Uh, but just in the last few days, we've kind of bounced off our lows. And I think we had gotten rather undervalued. Hogs is, is the wheat of the livestock. And what I mean by that, Sean, is the funds have really piled in on the short side of hogs, right, like they have in wheat. Um, so now I think you're starting to see a little bit of short covering rally because you are starting to see demand pick up based on, you know, we're into the grilling season. And, you know, again, beef is really rather high priced. So there is this cheaper alternative that people are starting to look at. Um, also, you look at weights. We are, we've seen weights drop, which means we're a lot more current on marketing. That, that glut of supply that we had up front is sort of dissipating. Uh, so yeah, I see more upside potential in hogs. It might not be straight up like it has been like, you know, the last five, six uh, trade sessions. But I think we are carving out a bottom here, Sean. And I think there is more upside potential there. That's great stuff. Hey, Ted, thanks so much for joining us here this week. Really appreciate it. Ted Seifert, Zanarag Hedge. Ted, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. Take care, buddy. Ted and I didn't even get to us breaking down the Chicago Bears offseason. Ted, a big Chicago Bears fan, myself included, and uh, yeah, we didn't get to that. We didn't have time. We ran out of time. <laughs> we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to hear from today's show sponsor, U.S. Borax. You're listening to Real Ag Radio. Did you know that Pioneer now has a full lineup of Enlist E3 soybeans? Take a look at Pioneer brand Enlist E3 soybeans for the highest yield potential and for the best agronomic package and herbicide trade options. From the lab to the field, Pioneer brand Enlist E3 soybeans are the best in beans, period. Ask your local Pioneer representative about Enlist E3 beans. As you head out into the field this season, the Corn School's got you covered. Everything from tillage discussions, weed control info, field trial results, yield strategies, and more. The Corn School on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BASF. Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com, from realagriculture.com, or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin, host of the Soybean School on realagriculture.com. Throughout the year, on the Soybean School, we'll bring you timely agronomic video content from planting to harvest, from the latest agronomic research to the latest in production technology. Check out our massive video library on YouTube, realagriculture.com, or download the audio podcast versions wherever you get your podcasts. The Soybean School is brought to you by Pride Seeds, BASF, and Syngenta Canada. Back to Real Ag Radio. It's now time for a product spotlight with U.S. Borax. We're talking to Roger Gunning. He is U.S. Borax's sales manager for agriculture in North America. Hey, Roger, great to chat with you. Hey, thank you, Sean, for having me on your program today. Yeah, and it's been great to have uh, U.S. Borax and talking about Granu Bore for the past number of weeks here on Real Ag Radio. Um, now, we, we've talked before about refined borate. Um, now, I, I guess from U.S. Borax's perspective, where exactly do your borates come from? Oh, that's a fun question, Sean. And few you know that uh, when they use boron from U.S. Borax, it actually comes from a boron, California, which is a small town. That that's how it got its name from the mineral. Um, but really, you know, to add more to this, um, boron is present everywhere in the environment, but substantial deposits of borates they're rel relatively rare. And that makes boron California unique. So um, our boron mine, it's one of the richest borate deposits on the planet. And this enables us to, to uh, produce approximately 1 million tons of refined borate for every year. And then we're able to distribute, distribute to our customers here, either in North America, uh, around the world. Um, or you could just say we supply about one third or a third of the world's refined borate products. Wow, that that's actually that's a kind of a staggering way to put that. How did those borates get to the field for growers? Um, well, most most don't know it, but it's really a multi-step process from from our mine. 
uh, to the farm. Um, once we extract the material from the ground, our borates will have need to go through a multi-step refining process to remove the impurities such as heavy metals, um, depending on the product. Um, now we'll either refine our borates at our operation in Boron, California. Uh, we may, depending on some of the products, we may send, the, send our ore off to um, an operation in Wilmington, California, uh, which is at the port of Los Angeles to be refined into finished product. Um, but depending, either way, uh, both operations during this stage of our refining process, we'll take the product samples and complete quality control checks um, at our site labs to ensure quality. Um, and all these steps are completed before the finished product can ship directly to our customers or one of our strategic stock points, um, either in North America or somewhere around the world, all done to better serve our customers when they need product. So when we're talking about uh, refined borate fertilizers, wh why does it matter where the borates come from? What, what, why is that significant? Um, it's about the purity, um, about the purity of the product, but for a few reasons, um, like take our North America farmers, uh, we're closer. Uh, the convenience of our distributors and warehouse locations with no import restrictions. And this helps allow us to provide a better service than other borate fertilizer suppliers. Um, our, supp our customers, um, they can be confident that we're providing them with a refined borate product free from impurities that may pose a problem you know, for, their, for their crops. Um, and another one that we, we always take in consideration is safety. We pride ourselves in having one of the highest safety records in the industry. Um, at, at the U.S. Borax, we mine a remarkable mineral that is essential for everyday life. But this should never come at the cost of a person's wellness. And we are determined to create the environment where everyone goes home safe and well every day after every shift and nothing less and that is acceptable. But, you know, Sean, to, to kind of close this up, you know, in the end, I, I really believe farmers do care where the products they purchase for their crops come from. The farmers I know I've had conversations with want to know the products they apply to their crops will make a positive difference to their bottom line. Farmers have high standards for their operation and they want the products they use and the companies they support to have the same high standards. Well, as we've been saying here on Real Ag Radio for the past couple months, Granny Boar from U.S. Borax, ask for it by name and go to borax.com. Roger, thanks so much for joining us here today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much and have yourself a, a great 23 season. Oh, well, thank you, Sean. We'll be right back on Real Ag Radio right after this. ABJ AgriProducts is North America's exclusive distributor for air bubble jets and easy jets. These sprayer nozzles reduce the number of driftable droplets and at the same time maintain a uniform droplet size, primarily between 300 and 400 micron, ensuring more even dispersion of your chemical products, providing reduced drift and increased plant coverage. Let us help improve your spraying operation by visiting abjagra.com. That's abjagri.com. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, the Wheat School on realagriculture.com has you covered. Timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with the Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. Welcome back to Real Lag Radio. Today's show is brought to you by U.S. Borax. Let me tell you about Granny Boar from U.S. Borax. Make sure you ask for it by name. Go to borax.com. I'm pleased to be here today with Dr. Terry Griffin. He's a cropping systems economist at Kansas State University. Terry, it's great to see you. Thank you, Sean. It is great to be here. 
Okay, uh, you recently wrote a report for USDA on tech adoption. It was entitled Precision Ag in a Digital Era. Um, you know, technology is, uh, I guess, uh, full throttle here right now. There's a bunch, a whole bunch of different forms of technology. W- when, you, when you write and do research about technology, uh, how, how do we define that? Like, because it's such an over-encompassing topic. It is. So, you know, technology today is obviously different than, you know, the really cool technologies from the 1940s, you know, fertilizer. You know, so the the word technology does have a different meaning throughout time. But since about the early 1990s, uh, precision agriculture, um, we can even say digital agriculture, has focused on uh, sensors and location through GPS and other uh, global navigation satellite systems, GNSS. And so that's where we've been focusing. Um, the USDA report uh, focused only on what we would call precision. Um, and we did a compare and contrast recently with a, a Canadian researcher, uh, Tomas Nielsen. And the Canadian report actually um, included newer um, forms of fertilizers being um, one of the technologies evaluated in the Canadian uh, study, but the American study from USDA was the traditional precision ag technologies. And many of these aren't new. Um, they were commercialized in the 1990s, maybe early 2000s. Uh, yield monitors, grid soil sampling, variable rate applications of fertilizer seeds, uh, crop protection chemicals, um, and the, I guess the newest ones on the list are automated section control that would have been commercialized about 2006 is the date I'm using. Yeah. Um, automated guidance, uh, the first year we asked that question was in 2001. Um, I say we, uh, it was the USD report for, for those who were uh, behind the effort then. And uh, so the technologies we're discussing aren't new. Uh, I guess the new flavor arising from these technologies is how we use data, um, big data, um, and the valuation of data beyond the farm gates. Once um, sensors collect the data and it gets pushed out, and and if an aggregator gets access to those data from many different farms, how is that being used in, in the industry? So that's the newest part of, of what we're talking about. Yeah, is the is the what, the in terms of adoption, what's enabling it? Is it the the push to become more efficient? Is it labor? What, what's kind of the main driving force now? Yeah, so we we've asked that question, and it's somewhat difficult to answer because you know back in the 1990s, if, if a farmer had a yield monitor on their combine, that meant that they went and uh, deliberately bought a yield monitor, brought it home, installed it, and started collecting data. You know, today it means that you bought a combine. You know, so even if you buy a used combine, there's a really good chance that there is a yield monitor there, whether you want it or not. So. The idea of adoption and utilization are two very different ideas. We can measure adoption. It's much more difficult for us to report on how those technologies get used. So, um, you know, for instance, automated guidance is one that we closely watch. And one of the reasons is it's the most widely used technology on our list. You know, we're, we're about two thirds of all planted acres uh, in the United States using um, some machinery that has automated guidance. And again, it, uh, this technology does come with a lot of new equipment, but since there are usually subscription uh, fees or other ways of turning it on, um, we can sort of measure the take rate on on that type of technology. Um, and, and some of the ones, and it's one of the newer ones, it's been around for 20, not quite 25 years yet. The technologies that were commercialized in the early 1990s when uh, GPS became available for civilian use, um, those adoption rates are much lower. You know, we're, we're still looking at less than a quarter, less than a fourth of um, planted acres that are devoted to grid soil sampling and verbal rate applications. Um, but you know those are technologies that require a lot more uh, effort 
a lot more training. Uh, it requires more human capital. It, it requires a farmer and the farm operator to take uh, their mental decisions away from other aspects of the farm operation and to apply it to the technology. Uh, whereas automated section control, automated guidance, um, the automated technologies kind of re remove that necessity for human capital and you know, plug and play. And so they, the farmer could focus on other things. Um, you know, for instance, you know, driving, you got 20 minutes between inroads. Automated guidance gives the farmer about 20 minutes hands free to do something other than steering the, the equipment. Uh, whereas yield monitors and variable rate technology requires more of their focus, more of their attention. And, and like if I, and this isn't just a farming thing, this is just, I think, humans' interaction with technology in general. You, th you think about all of the features that are in like Microsoft Excel or. Yep. All of the features that are in that new smart TV, you yep. you don't use all of it. In no. fact, a lot of times a buddy comes over and is like, oh, you just do this, this, and this. And you're like, it does that? Oh, my goodness, right? Um, there, there's like there's a sliding scale here in terms of what how people are using some of those given tools. Right. You're exactly right. It's not just the farming community. So one of my team members is a gerontologist, uh, Lavonda Trawick. She studies aging, okay? And, you know, I, I'm not sure if you're old enough to remember this, but m many of our listeners, including myself, remember, you know, as a child, our job was to be standing next to the television, turning channels until we – the right channel was found for whatever program was on, you know, and, and that skill set was replaced by a remote control, right? And so that remote control made life better for the person watching TV as well as the children whose job was to change channels or to twist the antenna. Yeah. Um, you know, and those types of technologies make life better and they're widely adopted, you know, and, and in agriculture, those are the poster child for things that get adopted. Automated guidance, automated section control. You know, I relate this to a herbicide tolerant soybean. You know, it may not have been better initially, but it was convenient. It made farming easier for that particular crop so that, that focus could be applied to improving yields for the other commodities. When you've compared and contrast some of your findings to what uh, Thomas Nielsen founded out of Olds College for Western Canada. Are, are there any big discrepancies, or is overall attitude, sentiment, and adoption of technology relatively the same? Uh, for the most part, everything is on the same trends. You know, there are some minor differences here and there, but you know, you could apply the same thing to um, uh, in the United States. So, you know, for instance, in the United States, we we focus on one crop each year. So. Um, the year we focus on corn, it's just the corn producing states. The year we focus on soybean, it's similar states, but maybe slightly different. Uh, the year that we focus on cotton and wheat, again, those are different states. You know, cotton would be the southeastern states in California. Uh, the year we focus on rice, uh, it's mainly Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, California. Uh, so it's a different region each year because of the commodity. Um, Canada is sort of the is a very different survey. It was across the entire country, across all provinces, across all commodities. So it's not directly apples to apples comparison to begin with, but the overall result at the end of the day was, yeah, um, farmers, not all farmers, uh, use technology. And that was one of the things I really want to talk about, especially when it comes to social media. Uh, one of the things that we both noticed is when we got on LinkedIn, Twitter, other social media platforms and said, hey, here's a report, publicly available, read it at your leisure, here are some tidbits we would you know, like to start, start the discussion. And it was amazing to watch, in statistics we call it confirmation bias, you know, it, it's based upon the world view. So a lot of the uh, responses from farmers were like, no, that's not right. You know, everybody in my community has been using the technologies for you know, a decade. I saw some you, of these reactions. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm sure you did. Yeah. And, and uh, I think that'd be good for us to just focus on that on our, on our social media for, for a while. I mean, and it had the opposite too. Like some people were like, no, no, nobody I know is using any of that. And so the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? And I think our reports are probably – 
I'm not going to say that they're exactly right all the time, but I think they're closer than what the worldview of each individual would bring to the table. Yeah, and and just because I have this really fancy monitor in my planter, and it has all the sensors, and it's collecting all this data, it's doing all this really cool stuff, and you know we can attach other keywords like you know uh, the cloud and everything. It doesn't mean I'm actually using it, mm-hmm. and, and that's kind of sometimes I think one of the gaps. It may be in the tractor, but I'm actually using it. Well, let me throw a little bit more complication to that. Um, my car um, collects information, tire pressure, uh, it collects engine diagnostics, and sends it back to the manufacturer. I'm not using it. Someone's using it. Yeah. I'm not using it. And so tractors kind of do the same thing, too. There's a lot of information being collected, a lot of data being collected, I should say, and that has been uh, transmitted back to the manufacturer. So um, as far as the uh, farm operator, um, you know, it, back, you know, we've been saying this for 20, 30 years. A lot of farmers treat the yield monitor as in cab entertainment, entertainment for the uh, equipment operator. And you're just kind of looking at it casually once in a while and maybe bump the hydrostat to see the numbers go up, you know, and which I firmly recommend people not to do that because those spikes in the data get recorded and I can remove those when we analyze yield monitor data, but we actually lose data points and that, that does come out of cost if you're wanting to use yield monitor data for on-farm experiments or you know drainage decisions for next year and so forth. Yeah. We'll have more of my discussion with Dr. Terry Griffin of Kansas State University. When we come back, you're listening to Real Ag Radio brought to you today by U.S. Borax. Join us for the Canadian Beef Industry Conference, August 15th to 17th at Calgary, Alberta. Spend time networking on the trade show floor, hear from keynote speakers, take in breakout sessions designed to increase profit, manage your rangeland, and navigate trends. Get up close to advanced techniques and hands-on demos, and experience bullfighting at the closing party. Proud, innovative, and loyal, we are beef. Registration is now open. Visit CanadianBeefIndustryConference.com for full details and to register. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio, brought to you today by U.S. Borax. You know, U.S. Borax's technical and scientific experts are dedicated to continuous research and product improvement. In collaboration with industry, education, and community leaders, they constantly explore new ways to optimize boron's unique properties in your existing applications and future innovations. Check them out, Borax. Com. We're talking to Dr. Terry Griffin. He is with Kansas State University. Terry, do you have any sense of what the farmer wants next out of technology? Well, let, let me answer that question in a slightly different way. Back, um, let's say year 2003, we were you know, in meetings and, and the uh, automated guidance companies were, were there and saying, hey, look, you know, we, this automated guidance is great. You don't have to drive the tractor. A lot of the farmers in that room 20 years ago were somewhat insulted by this notion of a algorithm from a satellite signal driving their equipment through the field. And farmer, farmers were saying, no, I can drive my own tractor. I mean, that, I can't believe you even suggested that. But fast forward to today, that's one of the technologies that those same people would say, you're not taking this away from me under no circumstances. Yeah. And it's something that they didn't know that they wanted and needed. You know, Steve Jobs did the same thing with the iPhone. I mean, you know, he said, well, I'm not listening to my customers about what they say they want. I'm going to show them what they need. Yeah. Um, yeah I got one for you. Air, yeah. air condi- in my car, air-conditioned yeah. seats. Mm-hmm. When I first heard about air-conditioned seats, I, okay, I live in Canada. I get heated seats. Mm-hmm. Air-conditioned seats sound really dumb. No, it does until not. You're in, until you're in a car in Arizona in the middle of summer, and you're like, air conditioning, oh, that's nice, right? There's, you know, We all have those experiences. 
No, I completely agree. My oldest son and I would give up, you know, the navigation system. We would give up AM radio, things we don't use. Uh, air-conditioned seats, aired seats for us with leather, and, you know, especially when we were in the south. Uh, yeah. we, you know, we just came from Arkansas. Those were not a luxury. That was a necessity. <laughs> uh, okay, so how does – how does, we're hearing so much about AI, Okay. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence, not okay. artificial insemination. We know what that yep. is in agriculture. So if you look at artificial intelligence and we overlay it on top of some of the current technologies we have, yep. where are we going from here? So, you know, automation is something I've been working on a lot. Um, you know, I'm not sure how, how many listeners we have to produce cotton, um, but uh, cotton has funded some of my research for harvesting. So you think of cotton as a as sort of a tree. You know, it's like an apple. You know, you get um, fruit that becomes ripe over time, and it's not the whole plant at the same time. And we can send in small autonomous robots to harvest fruit, cotton lint, that is ready to be harvested that day. And I spent a lot of time doing this. You know, from an economic standpoint, the, the harvesters are very expensive and they do only one thing. And if we can replace those with a whole bunch of small machines at a lower per acre cost, then they may become adopted. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to challenge um, your, your listeners on something. Um, I've, I've watched farmers. You know, as an economist, I, I don't just worry about dollars and cents. I worry about how people make decisions un under their circumstances. You know, everybody's different. Some people have more risk uh, aversion than others. Some people take more chances. Some people have endowed wealth so that they can take chances and have very little to uh, worry about. Well, hay farmers, okay? If you're going to bale hay, you know, why do we have a bunch of small bales being produced? And not everybody, I mean, there is a, a, a row for a small hay bale, but it seems like a lot of farmers I've talked to just enjoy baling hay. You know, and, and so it's not a dollars and cents economic decision, but it's a what economists call utility maximization, uh, utility, which means satisfaction, um, utility maximization scenario. You know, and, and that's fine, that, that's great. But it's really hard to model when we look at just dollars and cents. And so the reason I bring that up is there will be a pushback for autonomous, just like we had a pushback on automated guidance 20 years ago when farmers were somewhat insulted by the notion. Um, uh, small autonomous robots may be somewhat similar. You know, you talk to a lot of uh, farm operators, they enjoy operating equipment. And some of the largest acreage farmers, you know, they're in Western Canada. There's some really large acre farmers. Western Kansas are some large acre farmers. And large enough acreage that the farm operator may not ever sit in a tractor. You know, they have people who do that, and they may have an iPad and know where their tractors are, watching it uh, through telematics. Um, but some farm operators today tell me that they do not want to get so big with respect to acreage, that they are not the person on the combine during harvest. They are not on a tractor during planting season. And so that's a personal decision. And I think that's one of the things that may push back on autonomous adoption. You know, in, in some ways there's some parallels here, but it, but the, the line of the experience is actually a little bit ahead of the cropping systems, and that's dairy robots. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you talk to when you talk to a dairy farmer who has implemented a robot, um, and there there is the same sort of like I I need to be milking my cows. I don't need a robot to do. I need to know what's going on. But what you realize when you talk to people that have Im implemented them is the fact that you know I'm still in the barn. Uh, my role in the barn has changed, and I now have all of this new information that's actually quantitative that I'm getting from the robot that is milking the cows that allows me to make better production systems. That was way better than my qualitative perceptions that I was previously getting when I didn't have the robot. That, that to mm -hmm. me, is something that we need to be paying attention to when we talk about cropping system technology. And a, another word used in that situation is trust. You know, uh, initially, we have very little trust in a new autonomous system, whether it's automated guidance or really anything where we relinquish control. Uh, but once we learn that... And a lot of times it's a black box. Once we learn that this black box is trust, 
trustworthy, then we start to relinquish our control to it. Um, but, you know, it's hard for us to give up control. It's once that trust is gained is the, to me, is the barrier. You know, that's the pivot point. When you talk to innovators, is, is there enough money flowing into this sector? Is there too much money flowing into this sector? Like, uh, what are you hearing from the, from the developers? So, yeah, uh, both. You know, we, we've seen, you know, trillions of dollars flowing into ag tech and big data in the last you know, decade. You know, uh, I guess the big one was when, uh, at the time, Monsanto bought a climate corporation for a billion dollars or so. Um I, I spent a little bit of time with some different developers, and some of them are, are struggling to get the um, uh, financing. Uh, so there's that. But we are seeing some really big numbers floating around, too. Uh, I, I will say that for a lot of developers in the ag tech space where I spend my time, you know, I spend my time more on the analytics and data than I do on the hardware. Uh, hardware is hard to replicate. Um, digital is a lot easier to imitate. So, for instance, if we build a really cool economic statistical model that provides a lot of value from farm data to within the farm gates back to the farmer or to the cooperative, to ag retailer or, or other uh, data sharing groups, those types of digital services are so easy to imitate. So, you know, especially if the, re if the recommendation coming from this legitimate tool is a number, let's say yield forecast, okay? We can make yield forecasts for corn, soybean, wheat, and a lot of people really watch these things. The commodity traders, um, you know, the, the whole world was watching the Kansas wheat tour, um, last week, two weeks ago. Okay. Well, if I want to make an imitation of that, you know, it's not hard to get Excel to create a random number and maybe even just add a somewhat of an error from last year's number. And it looks reasonable, right? And it, I could create this at virtually no cost. And for the, the legitimate companies, legitimate products, you know, they're, they're sort of disincentivized to bring their tools to market because they can be offset by a imitator so easily. Mm, interesting. I, I, what, I, what I was wondering, too, about this discussion about uh, success and you know, funding is you know, so many times ag tech is judged by rounds of VENCAP or the amount of money that's flowing into a given product mm. or company. But sometimes forgotten in this discussion is the return that's being created at the farm gate, you know, and, yep. and that, that customer retention and the customer acquisition Th that, that sort of slips through the cracks. Uh, I, I feel a lot of times in this ag tech discussion. It, it does. And, and if we look really closely, most of the tools that do get commercialized in the digital space are not intended to benefit within the farm gate so much as they are intended to benefit the aggregators beyond the farm gates. Mm -hmm. And, you know, within the farm gates, you know, you look at what farmers actually adopt, you know, things that make life better, automated guidance, automated section control are adopted a lot more readily than yield monitors or other sensors. Um, and yield monitors are great, but it takes a lot of training to make use of that. And it's somewhat limited uh, to the fields that those data were collected. But for instance, Let's say you, you choose a farmer in your area and you send me all the data for all their acres. There's very little I can do to benefit myself as an analyst from one farm's data somewhere in the world. But if you were able to get all the farmers in Alberta, Manitoba, uh, you know, to me, yeah, there's some really cool things I could do. I could get the attention of uh commodity traders that can get the attention of a, a lot of different groups. And that's where a lot of the emotion activity is happening in digital ag right now. Do you see any differences in the adoption and the just the overall focus maybe when it comes to tech relative to farm size? Like I, I think, you know, you, you talk about, uh, you know, uh, autonomy and uh, some of the robotics, people think, oh, that's going to benefit the big farmer. 
But I, I don't know. There seems to be a lot of tools now being developed for the medium and smaller farmers too. What, what, what have you seen? Yeah. In research? No, I completely agree. And I've thought about this a little bit too. So, you know, uh, one of the things, that, you know, if you got twenty, thirty thousand acres, you, you get a lot of data points, and you even get some different weather regimes. You know, across that many acres, um, you got some different varieties, different products. You can get a lot of good insights just from your own acres. Now, if you're a really small farmer, so small that you don't have your own harvesting equipment, you're initially at a disadvantage, but what you probably are doing is having a custom operation, custom harvest operation come in to harvest. Well, those groups typically have all the sensors, uh, and so that data gets fed back to smaller farms. Uh, the medium-sized farmers that may have their own equipment, but not all the technology, would not receive that feedback loop of yield monitor data because they may not have all the bells and whistles. So like in our study, um, we were looking at, let's say automated guys, I have the chart here. Um, for automated guidance, the smallest farms on corn that in our sample, well, let's say 500 acres, I'm, I'm rounding up to the nearest, Hundred. So, yep. a 500 acre farm is considered small, and on the larger end, uh, 1,700 acres was um, larger. Um, and at 1,700 acre farm, 80% of farmers had automated guidance, but at 500 acres, it was a lot lower ad adoption rate. And you know, the same is true for yield monitors and and um, other data technology. So there is a huge difference in adoption and take rates from small acres farmers to large acre farmers. Automation, we don't have that in our uh, USDA study yet. Um, automation is going to change a lot of things. You know, think about cotton again. So the smallest cotton farms in the USDA study were about 2,000 acres. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, so that's a much bigger acreage farm than the bigger corn farms in the study. And the reason is a cotton harvester uh, is a dedicated machine that does one thing, it harvests cotton. And to cash flow this thing, you need to fuel fully utilize it. And it's about 2,000 acres that it can harvest in the southern states given machinery dynamics and weather regimes. And so cotton farms tend to be on increments of 2,000, 2,000 acres, 4,000 acres, 6,000 acres. Well, corn, you know, if, if you, you can harvest grain sorghum, wheat, soybean, a lot of different crops with the same machine you'd harvest corn with. So you don't have to have that same lumpy uh, acreage for that. Well, if we go to an automated autonomous robotic small machines, swarm bots for cotton, all of a sudden that 2,000 acres gets loosened up a whole bunch. We can have a 40 acre cotton farm and this 40 acres doesn't have to be a square. You know, it can be along, you know, seven sides of the field could be a creek, you know, and doesn't have to be rectangles anymore. So that's going to open up acreage for production and acreage for uh, relatively small farms. Yeah. Kind of a game changer for for sure. Terry, really appreciate the discussion here today. Uh, this is great. It's obviously a, a topic that's very, very critical in the now and into the future. It's not going away and uh, continue to have discussions with you about it. So thank you so much. Thanks, Sean. It was a pleasure being here today. Very cool. Lots of fun. Hey, I'd love your feedback on the, that conversation with Dr. Terry Griffin. You can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also find us across all the different social media platforms as Real Agriculture. Or call that Real Ag feedback line, 855-776-6147. Big shout out to U.S. Borax for being today's show sponsor. As I've been saying all day, make sure you go to borax.com to find out more. Thanks so much, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio, and we will chat again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody.